Uh, today I'm going to talk about homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, it is a very rare disorder. We more commonly treat uh, the common hypercholesterolemia or the heterozygous one, but since this is a topic about rare diseases, we're going to talk about the homozygous form. So this is the outline of the picture, uh, lecture. We're going to talk about the molecular basis, genetics, criteria for diagnosis, cardiac complications, treatment, novel treatments, and future therapies. Uh, so it is uh, very rare. It is uh, thought to be uh, affecting one in a million uh, cases, but recently uh, it is thought to be more common affecting one in 300,000. The heterozygous uh, form affects one in uh, 500 uh, of the population. It is generally lethal before completion of the third decade of life if left untreated. And unfortunately, I have uh, seen families uh, where uh, all the kids affected by this disorder actually passed away before the age of 25. Morbidity and mortality are due to cardiovascular uh, complications. And I have to be uh, honest that uh, although uh, like I dealt with those patients, I have only seen like eight or nine cases in my uh, practice so far, it is very rare. And at one point, I was the primary doctor to take care of those patients. But now I'm happy to say that there are lipid specialists and endocrinologists who are treating those patients. And those patients come to me for the cardiovascular complications. So first, we're going to talk about LDL uh, uptake in the liver and why this is very important for the pathogenesis of uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. If you look at this uh, figure, uh, on the left, this is how the LDL receptor is manufactured in the hepatocytes, and then it is transported to the uh, cell membrane, where it takes the LDL, uh, and you can see the small square on the LDL, that's apolipoprotein. And then, actually, uh, a slide was deleted from my talk. Yeah, there is a, this is the slide that I wanted to show. This is how the, the, the transport of the LDL receptor to the cell membrane. The LDL receptor binds the LDL with the help of a beta uh, beta lipoprotein, and then as you can see there, uh, there is the, the one that looks like a Pac-Man. This is an enzyme called PCCSK9. This degrades LDL, and the one that looks like a rectangle, it's called LDL receptor uh, associated protein one, and it's also very important for the pathogenesis of some of uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. Now, more than 90% of cases of familial hypercholesterolemia are related to defect in the LDL receptor. Uh, the others are less than 10% of all the other combined cases. Uh, so the most important one is defects in the LDL receptor. So uh, this is now focusing on the main form, the LDL receptor you can see there either be no LDL receptor whatsoever, LDL is completely absent, and we call this null, null mutation, or it can be defective. If the activity is less than 2%, they call it completely absent. If it is around up to 25%, they call it defective. Now going to see here, another form of familial uh, hypercholesterolemia affecting the apoprotein B. Uh, there is a, a mutation causing the LDL receptor not to attach very well to the LDL. So there is less internalization of the LDL and uh, leading to hypercholesterolemia. Okay, now this is uh, a, an unusual form of mutation affecting the PCSK9 uh, gene. The PCSK9, as we said before, degrades LDL. And if there is a mutation that leads to gain of function, now the PCSK9 is actually working double effort, degrading more and more LDL uh, receptor, that leads to less LDL receptor available on the cell membrane and a hypercholesterolemia. Uh, 
So this is affects less than 5% of the cases. The last one I will show, uh, something, guys, something wrong happened with my slides. Anyway, uh, I wanted to, I'm gonna go to A1 here. If you look at the last one, LDL receptor associated protein one, uh, this is one probably the rarest, and it's the only one that is uh, autosomal recessive. Uh, all the others are autosomal dominant. So the, now coming to the genetics of the disorder, the most common one, as we said, is on chromosome 19, affecting the LDL receptor. Patients can be simple homozygotes, meaning same mutation affecting the same alleles of the gene. So we call this simple homozygote. The most common is to have compound heterozygote, which is different mutations, but affecting the same gene. And the other form is double heterozygous, which is very rare, different genes affect, uh, affected with different mutations. Uh, all the disorders of familial hypercholesterolemia are autosomal dominant, except the one affecting the LDLR uh, associated uh, protein one, which is autosomal recessive. And depending on the genotype, the phenotype can be different. So the level of hypercholesterolemia varies with the type of uh, genotype you have. Absent LDL receptor, which means you have null mutation affecting both LDL receptors is the most severe and the least, least responsive to therapy. So how we diagnose it, and there was used to be a, this criteria, but this now is almost obsolete because of the treatment. So they said there is genetic confirmation of two mutant alleles of the LDLR, abobluteoroutine, PCSK9, and LDL uh, RAP1 gene locus. You can make the diagnosis like this, or by the levels. But now the levels are not very important because we have some ther therapies that decrease the LDL to a level that this criteria is not working anymore. And family history is very important. If you have two parents with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. So again, this criteria is now obsolete because of the treatment. So what happens? Manifestations, these are pictures of xanthomas. It can happen continuously or in tendons, xanthomas. And we have the Arcus cornea, which can affect also uh, patients as young as 10 years. So those usually appear on children as young as five or six years. All these are lipid uh, deposits. And the cardiovascular manifestations. This is a CT angiogram of a patient. You can see the lipid deposits. The ones uh, in yellow are not calcified in the aorta. So this is a picture CT of the aorta and the ascending aorta and the uh, RCA. We don't see the LCA, the left coronary artery, because it's completely occluded. Uh, so you can see the yellow ones, our lipid deposits are not calcified yet, and the white ones are calcified. So there is lipid deposition in the, on the aortic valve and the supravalvar area. This is what determines the prognosis of those patients, the aortic valve and the supravalvar area. This is the most affected areas. This is an angiogram. Again, you can see the RCA here on the left is white patent, but we don't see left, okay? So the left is completely occluded. And if you look, the angiogram is taking in the ascending aorta, you can see there is narrowing of the ascending aorta after the valve. You can see the ascending aorta is narrowed because of the cholesterol deposits. And you can see also some contrast down of the valve. That means the valve is also not closing well. It's calcified. So there's aortic regurgitation as well. Sometimes there is collateral, but sometimes not. No. This is again two CT scans of different patients showing the, deposit, uh, the lipid deposits. And you can see the narrowing uh, above the aortic valve in that patient, again, or the one on the right, we don't see the LCA. The patient on the left has still the LCA and the RCA are patent. This is the two patients after treatment. So those patients under, underwent revascularization surgery. 
uh, one of them underwent uh, like in, from the lima uh, and, and one from a radial artery to fix uh, the narrowing. So you can see they had an adult surgery at uh, the age of 10 years and 11 years. And this is the pathology of those patients uh, showing the calcium deposits and sorry, the lipid de deposits. There you can see all deposits uh, with the red stain you can see calcification and atherosclerosis. And this is uh, a view from the surgeon. You can see how rough the surface is. It's all like calcium and uh, lipid calcification. So now how do we treat familial hypercholesterolemia? Lifestyle modifications with low fat diet and exercise, but we have to be honest, this kind of leads only to one to 2% uh, improvement in the cholesterol level. So we have to start medications and you have to start statins and ezetimibe as soon as you make the diagnosis. And some people have started those medication even in the first year of life. Uh, Mebo medicine, lombetabide, uh, and the other medications I'm gonna talk about. Liver transplant is a rare type of therapy and there is genetic therapy as well. And there is a plasmapheresis. So coming to talk to statins, these are the horse. This is what we usually rely on as first-line therapy. HMG CoA reductase inhibitors is the primary treatment for all patients. You can start in the first year of life, starting as statins, and side effects are rare in children. In most studies, that there was no patients who stopped the medication because of side effects. And it show, and most studies also showed that it can reverse intimal thickening uh, in the carotids, and there was significant survival of patients. Even, let's say, a 20 or 30 percent reduction in LDL because of the statins, it resulted in uh, more than double uh, the survival in patients. So this is a, a study of uh, rosuvastatin. Uh, which is a crystal uh, showing a significant improvement in the LDL level and other uh, uh, lipid profile, usually results in around the 25% uh, improvement uh, in patients with some LDL receptor activity. But patients with no LDL receptor activity, usually the improvement is less. Is it MIP? is a medication that inhibits GI absorption uh, of cholesterol. Now, whenever we see a patient with heterozygous uh, hypercholesterolemia or homozygous, we start it immediately with a statin. The dose is usually 10 milligrams. Uh, and uh, even if you start it with a statin, there's usually no increase in side effect and it improves the, uh, let's say the, the incidence of cardiovascular complications by around 6%. Lipoprotein apheresis. So for my experience, I have, this is the three lines of me, uh, therapies that I have done, statins, uh, ezetimibe, and lipoprotein apheresis. And the other modalities that I'm going to talk about, to be honest, I have not done myself, but with the help of uh, the rest of the team. Lipoprotein apheresis is high cost and disruptive to lifestyle, but very effective in clear, clearing LDL and other inflammatory proteins. Ideally started before the age of five and must before the age of eight, can reverse xanthomas. And recently, and there are new therapies that can actually come in place of apheresis and some patients stop. Yes, so some patients were able to come off apheresis because of new therapies that we're gonna talk about. So this is a patient with a severe xanthoma on the knee. And this is after a few years of treatment with apheresis, the xanthoma uh, reversed. Now coming to talk about the new therapies uh, for familial hypercholesterolemia, MIBO medicine and PCSK9 inhibitors and lomitabide. Uh, so MIBO medicine, is an antisense uh, oligo, uh, oligonucleotide that affects the manufacturing of aboblubrotein B, so decreases the production of VLDL. Uh, lomitabide uh, also affects the absorption of uh, LDL, uh, sorry, of cholesterol in the gut, 
and the secretion of uh, LDL from the liver and the PCSK9, I will come to in more detail. So mebomedicine, uh, second generation antisense oligonucleotide inhibition of aboprotein B100 synthesis. It's given sub Q, side effects are injection, side reactions and flu-like symptoms. So far, it's, uh, it's been approved in children more than 12 years, but not younger than 12 years. Lumetabide has been approved in adults, but not yet in pediatrics. It inhibits the microsomal triglyceride transfer protein MTB. It must be given with very low, uh, low diet. It causes steatohepatitis and steatoria. It affects the absorption of LDL from the intestine. So if you are still taking a lot of fat with this medicine, all the fat will be in the stool and you will have severe steatoria. Again, if you are taking a lot of fat and taking this medicine, it will lead to significant LDL or cholesterol deposition in the liver with the steatohepatitis. So the patient must be on very low fat diet when taking this medication. PCSK9 inhibitors. So again, PCSK9, if you remember, it's an enzyme that degrades the LDL receptor. And if this enzyme is broken down or you target it, that will result in more LDL receptors. Uh, so there are two medications, alirocumab and evolucumab, which are available here and some people are taking them already. Those are monoclonal antibodies that lower plasma LDL C levels by binding BCSK9 and upregulating LDL receptor expression on hepatocytes. So some patients with the heterozygous form and some of the uh, homozygous form with defective LDL receptor are able uh, to come off apheresis. But if you have a completely absent LDL receptor, like the null and null mutations, then you, this, these medications do not work because you cannot upregulate something that is not there. So uh, it only works where, when there is some LDL activity. So this is a study of uh, alirocumab in patients more than 12 uh, years old. Uh, it showed significant uh, benefit. Initially, there was a double-blind study, and then they shifted the study to an open label to look, to look at the long-term uh, side effects and efficacy. And if you look here, uh, the red one is the patients with placebo, and the uh, blue one is the patients with alirocumab. You can see significant reduction in the, in the LDL level by around 26%. And the difference, sorry, the difference between them, between placebo and alirocumab was around 35%. And these are the absolute numbers. We're not gonna go over them, but you can see there on the far right, there's a 36% difference between placebo and uh, alirocumab, and also aboburtin B, non-HDL cholesterol and total cholesterol, all were much better with alirocumab. And some patients taking this medication now, sub-Q, are actually stopped taking statins. Uh, some of my adult colleagues are doing this. I, I found this surprising. They say instead of being on daily medication, they just give them alirocumab twice uh, a week. For me, I think we still should use the statins, less expensive, more known, less side effects uh, that we know of so far. But some people already move to sub-Q injections every two weeks, even for common hypercholesterolemia, not even the familial one, because they are just so effective actually. Uh, now, this is a new medication that has not been uh, FDA approved yet, but uh, almost there. Evina Kumab, this, this medication also works for the null, null mutations. Uh, this medication affects uh, a protein called uh, angiobiotin-like uh, one protein which works in the liver. And even patients with null and null mutations were able to come significantly down on LDL level. So what's important in this study, it's that because the patients were on maximum therapy when it was done. And even on maximum therapy, when you start evanicumab, there was still a significant reduction again to almost normal level. You can see the patients ended up with levels of 140 
uh, milligram LDL, which is only mildly elevated. So this is a very good medication. Hopefully we'll see it in the market very soon. And this is a very important slide because it shows that even patients who are null, null mutations had a significant reduction in the LDL. So this is kind of like the projected or uh, advised uh, algorithm for treatment. And once you make the diagnosis, you can start statin, lifestyle medications, and ezetimibe. You can also go with the LDL apheresis. This is my experience. And now going to the new therapeutic options, PCSK9 inhibitors, gene therapy is yet to come, liver transplant, NGBTL3 inhibitor coming in the future. The one I deleted, this, this is from an article from 2014. Those medications are not used anymore because there was significant side effect and even increase in mortality. The CETP inhibitors are not available anymore. Lumetabide and mibomyrcin. Mibomyrcin approved by the FDA for patients more than uh, 12 years. Lumetabide, not yet. And I had one patient who underwent liver transplant from a father and doing well, was transferred from being homozygous to a heterozygous patients with much liver, lower levels. So this shows you the level of LDL in a patient who started baseline, then statin, plus ezetimibe, plus apheresis. And then when you add other medications, you can decrease the LDL to very significant levels. Liver transplantation corrects molecular cause of the disease associated with significant drop up to 80% in the LDL level. Donor shortage is an issue. You're also replacing one disease by another. Now the patient also has liver transplant. He has to take immunosuppressive medications. Also, you have to have a donor. Surgical complications for both donor and the recipient are major obstacle for the therapy and lifelong immunosuppression. Genetic therapy, there is a study that has been completed, but results not yet published on adenovirus associated vector uh, uh, to treat patients with uh, homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. The study finished uh, two years ago or in 2020, but so far yet the results are, have not been published. So we're waiting on that. 